probably better. I don't know if you can't see this because my screen's half right now for until I get this up. But it's it's usually better to look at the camera than to look at like me as the screen because when people are scrolling, they feel like someone's making eye contact with them, and they feel like, oh, I gotta look because someone's talking to me. Can oh, I see live. what's happening? Can I look on your yeah, yeah. feed, or will that be feedback? Oh, you might. Um, what happens is there's a 30 second delay, so you might hear yourself like it, it'll throw you off. You'll you'll hear that echo. Yeah, I'm not gonna do if it. You go to Facebook and you go to um, I think just a news feed where it doesn't automatically play or it's automatically muted. That might work. Well, yeah, I'll wait. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna try to set that up. So I got a ring light. So this is the ring light that I bought. It was ten dollars. Sweet. And it's a clip, so it clips on. Because here's where the camera sits. So it clips on like for the camera, week. but the thing is it broke already. It was only $10 and it broke within a week. So I would not recommend this. Oh, are you going to tape it? Uh, well, what happened was you, you um, recharge it with the cord. And when I, now when I push it in, it actually pushed the charging port back into the unit. So it's oh. completely broken. That's why I took off the little board and it's, like, it's supposed to solder it right there. And, Oh my God! Uh, you know, the soldering iron. You want to do that. Yeah. Now you got to buy a soldering iron. I'm not going to. <laughs> <laughs> it's just uh, like I look at some of those. You know, when I was doing some research, and I'm like, I know it's like thirty bucks, and there are a ton of good reviews, but you can pay for those reviews. And yes. anytime I get anything that's like, like a charger or headphones or something that's less expensive, they always just break. It yeah. doesn't last long. That's, and that's my experience. That's why I thought $10, it's not that much of a risk, but then yeah. I got what I paid for, really. But I also liked it because it would look portable. Like it looked it's really easy to get around. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, one, yeah. I think I saw on your page, Louise Woods was recommending a certain one, but that one comes with a tripod and like an arm. And like, I can't travel that around everywhere. Yeah, I might like invest in that just because I'll be doing a lot of things stationary. Like uh, I'm doing a lot more online kind of corporate training and facilitation. So for that, I'm like, ah, it would be worth it to invest in that stuff to have like a little setup. Oh yeah, for sure. For sure. Like I agree with you. Like I think investing in it now because it's going to be around for a long time. Yeah. Even this, after is, all this. this is a, another um, addition to what we do. So I wanted to get ahead of it and, and then start investing in it. And, and you can get something fairly inexpensive, but yeah, I want to, I want to like make sure it's quality. I think that's a big thing that could set people apart is just the quality of the video now. Oh, I completely agree with that. I totally agree with that. Cool. So let's get started with improv history. We're, we're actually, no, let's wait another three minutes. I, I like to give people five minutes just in case they're running late or in case people want to ask questions. So we have three more minutes to kind of riff between you and I. Yeah. That's yeah. cool. But, but yeah, so how has the online stuff been? Uh, like, I, I love it, honestly. Like, uh, you know, I did that, um, uh, that scene today with Key, who I never would have been able to before, or at least not as easily. And now it's yeah. like, you could just reach out to people and say like, hey, this distance isn't gonna stop us now from doing a show together. Or I wanted to do something with you, let's do it. And you start experimenting, you start playing around with like the camera and the different angles. And what if I go in closer? And then what if I pull back? And what if I move around? So for me, I'm like, I'm very excited because I get to play with people that I don't normally get to play with. Awesome, awesome. I noticed, I watched the one with you and Brian Flermo and I thought that was so funny too. I love that. Oh my God. If you go back and watch this, he had some lines which were like, you're just dumb enough to be engaging or something. He had so many great lines and I was trying not to laugh, but he is so fun. He's such a fun person too. We have John Gilkey from Birmingham. He's part of an improv team called Box of Frogs. And he says, hello from Birmingham. We also have Carla, if I know Carla Dingle, she's really cool. And then Steven Royka from Vegas. So we have a couple of viewers and they're all just saying hello. Oh, well tell, please. Hello everyone. Thank you so much for, for tuning in. Can I share this? What can, uh, I think you can, if, if you go on your phone, might be a good way to share it as I'm opposed gonna, to doing it from your computer. I'm going to do it on my phone right now. So yeah. I'm going to share it. Mm -hmm. um, technology within technology. So you were talking about how um, you can use like the framing and stuff like that. And I've been saying that for years because we talk about like doing fire here or having like, we're doing, I'm doing something called Fist Theater where we do Hamlet. <laughs> Miley faces on her fingers and everything. So I bought these 
old school popsicle sticks that you use to make log cabins or whatever. And what I'm gonna do with them is I'm gonna use them like as puppets. And then um, I'm gonna do like, like a little paper puppet on it. And it's gonna be one of the characters that walks across the screen. So I'm excited about that. Oh, that is hilarious. Yeah, but that's, I agree with you. It's like manipulating the genre that we have for the art form as, for, as opposed to forcing the art form on the genre. I totally agree with no, you. No, 100%. I think like you get away from trying to force things into this form that this format that isn't gonna work. Mm -hmm. so, so instead of that, you could just take and look at the what you can do here. I worked with a group the other day and I was like, uh, turn off your camera, go pick out like a crazy outfit in your wardrobe, come back and we're gonna do like a town hall. Yeah. And they all came back in and they renamed themselves. It was like a super fun way to play. Yeah. Carla just recently on this group, I think it's Improv Discussion and Resources. I don't remember the name of the group, but I think this was. She put a list of all these games that work for her. Town Hall was one of them. And uh, ABC is one of them. And those ones, I, stuff like that does work. Yeah. yeah I think. And you look and you start now creating your own as well. Yeah. Like start creating I'm your totally own game. Yeah, that's what I'm looking forward to is the people that create the new stuff. Like that's that's the evolution of improv. That's what I want to see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's what makes me really excited. It's like, it's like the wild, wild west, man. It's anything goes right now. And you see so many people be creative in this situation that I'm very excited about it. I know some people are, are, are hesitant and feel like they can't get the same reaction live. And it's like, well, absolutely. Like, and if, if you're one of those people who, don't want to use this format and you want to wait till you get back live with people and that's the way you feel comfortable improvising, then great, do that. But for me, I'm like, what an opportunity. Yes. Well, you said something um, in an older post where you said that you really like it because it's forcing people to slow down and listen a lot more instead of being quick with their responses. It forces them to yeah. slow down, which I think is a really good opportunity. Yeah, I think it's, it's going to be the best thing to happen improv because you have to wait to respond. You cannot talk over each other. And when you do, you, oh boy, you notice it. So it's gonna force everyone to slow down, take a moment. And it's really like, I've, I've been teaching a lot about having these emotional reactions to what's being said. And the scenes are great. Awesome, that's awesome, I love it. And I wonder if on the other end of this is if there'll be a new short form game that's called online improv where people sit in their little squares and they try to recreate this, which I think would be kind of interesting too. Oh, it'd be so great because then online, you like when you're doing that live on a stage, you can freeze up. Yeah, <laughs> stuff and like that, like doing like whatever you do. And that's the only way, the only way that all of this is gonna work for me yeah. is like, great idea, let's try it. Like with any good improv, it's like, I don't know, let's give it a shot. Like, let's not worry about a lot of people are very precious with their improv and they're worried about like how they look and like, oh, I, I, I don't look good online or I'm very uncomfortable or like we might make a mistake. And it's like, for us veterans, especially people have been doing it for a long time, that danger is coming back because it could go horribly wrong for real. Like it could be, it could be a terrible disaster. And so that's what you feel like when you first start improvising is like, you're afraid it's gonna go bad. And then you get to a point where maybe you get more comfortable or you're like, I don't care. Now it's back where you're like, oh man, this, this really could go wrong because you're involving technology too. And anytime you involve technology, there's always a risk of something going wrong. Yeah, and, and this is gonna move perfectly into what we're talking about. We should start class right now. But at one point that there were certain different technologies in theater, like lighting programs or sound systems or whatever, like there's always gonna be that learning curve with the new technology that pops up. I totally agree with that. I remember I saw, there's a group in Amsterdam, Boom Chicago, and they are like second city in Amsterdam. So they do like sketch comedy and improv. And it was started by a couple uh, guys who went through the second city program and then um, moved over there. And they did an exchange like early 2000s where Boom Chicago did a week of shows at second city and the second city cast did a week of shows at Boom Chicago. And Love Boom it. Chicago came in and it was like, they had cameras and monitors and they were doing like handheld rap, mic, uh, using handheld mics for rapping and things like that. And I watched and I went, oh my God, this is unbelievable. Second City is gonna seal all this stuff. And they didn't, <laughs> they didn't take any of it. They didn't. They didn't use a lot of the video or anything. I was very surprised because I was like, this is such a great 
it's going to open up so much more that you can do. Like it was such a big change and it was, I loved it. I loved watching. I was blown away at the technology that Boom Chicago was using and using wow, the videos and monitors and stuff. And then Second City started adding some, but like it wasn't the same. Like they, they do their show and they do it very well. Uh, but I thought, wow, this could be a real game changer. And there's been a couple of times where that has happened, where it's like, this could be a game changer and it, it, it doesn't necessarily change the game that much. What we're in right now is a game changer. It is, I mean, this is literally the game changer of our lives right now. We have to go from a live form to online. And how do you get that same feedback? And how do you do that same, um, give a same quality show to people? And then also, how do you get out of it? What you got out of it doing live? Yeah, 100%. Uh, really quick, Carla Dingle posted that she finds online improv is challenging but it makes her be a better instructor, improviser, and scene partner. And probably very similar to what you said earlier, where it forces you to slow down, it forces you to listen. Yeah. And, and of course it's hard. You haven't done it. Like not a lot of people have taught it online. So like for us to expect, oh, we're going to go from the energy of a live classroom. And I'm not saying Carla's saying this, but I'm saying like it's, it's natural that you're going to struggle at first. Like the first couple of times I did it online, I was very exhausted at the end because I was so worried about technology. I felt my energy had was higher than normal. I was trying to like, okay, are, is everybody engaged? How do I keep them engaged? So it's going to be a bit of a change, but I think pretty soon people adapt to what's going on and they're with you. And they're just, uh, the most comments I'm getting are from people who say, thank you. This is the first time I've laughed all day or all week or in the past three weeks. So that's awesome. Yeah. Okay. So, so we're going to get into the class. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm read through the timeline and you stop me at any time or I'll check in with you and you can add what you think or what you believe or all that kind of stuff. And the timeline was set as like a base standard. So everyone attending this class is like, this is the timeline we're going to, we're going to kind of lean into, but that doesn't mean that it's correct or it doesn't mean that it's the last word. Uh, to people who are watching, I want you to, I want to reiterate that um, people, instructors or even I might say contradicting information um, please go out and check your own resources and then maybe find your own truth, find your own, especially when it comes to philosophies, which can be more subjective, use what works for you, totally. Um, so let's move on to the very first moment. And you might disagree with me on the very first thing I'm gonna say is that uh, improv began in the 18th century with Commedia dell'arte. Do you think that that's when improv began or do you think it was earlier or later? Well, my answer is it started with the dawn of humankind. Exactly. So talk about that a little bit. Talk, yes, exactly. I mean, it started with people interacting with each other. That's improvisation. So there was no script or any to any of this. And so I think that it started then. And, you know, uh, people ask, like, how long have you been improvising? And, and I heard somebody say once since birth. And then I was like, oh, what? And then now I'm like, no, it's true. So for me, I'm like the dawn of whenever um, you know creatures came into existence, it was improv. And whether it's you know um, kinesthetic response of like one predator going towards its prey and it moves away, or or um, birds coming together, like that's all like a, a response that um, improv relies on too. So I think it started there, and improv is about the ensemble. So then pretty soon creatures and humans are like let's get in a pack let's get together this if we are together as an ensemble as a pack then we'll survive so to me it's like it started then what if you're talking like when did stage improvisation start like yeah probably Commedia dell'arte is like where it gets traced back to as far as like a stage or professional performance sure awesome uh austin mooney who's from funny people society in fullerton i think you coached them um he says yeah, in all caps yes jay i agree he totally says. <laughs> thanks austin um so from there i move on to 1930s kind of vaguely because i haven't found a specific date for that but this is when viola spolin began to teach children theater and she developed a few games that we still play today like gibberish games and guessing games and stuff like that um do you have any thoughts about that yeah go back you can Talk Gotta go back to her teacher, Neva Boyd. I'm gonna write that up. Good. Go, Neva go, go. Boyd. Neva Boyd founded the Hull House in Chicago, and Neva Boyd was a sociologist who really emphasized the play, um, the importance of play in people and in adults. But she created a lot of um, improv games as well, and people don't realize that she created some games that help children overcome language barriers uh, um, as well. So Neva was Viola's teacher, and so. Mm -hmm. The first two, for me, the first two important people uh, on the Mount Rushmore of improv are those two, Viola Spolin and uh, Neva Boyd. And because of that, 
improv is a very feminine art form because we take care of each other. And this is also something I learned from like Jane Morris and Jeff Michalski as well. Like those are two, two of my mentors who are just, I know you've talked to Jane and she's a wealth of information. Jeff is as well. Like they're both amazing historians and they, they have huge impact on improv themselves being teachers and performers. Um, they are the founders of the ETC theater in second city, which is the second resident company of the second city. And so, um, they have such a huge impact in, in improv. Uh, and I was very excited to see that you were, you were, um, using her because she definitely is someone you could talk to for many, many, many sessions. Oh my God. But that's kind of what inspired these classes was I just, she, ran, I can't remember who connected to each other first, but she just randomly started telling me all this stuff about improv. I'm like, Everybody wants to hear this. Now, I, I was like blown away. I'm like, dude, everyone needs to hear these little stories you're telling because these are so, not only they're so interesting, they're so important too. So yes, I totally agree with that. Yeah, a lot of people uh, equate like, especially long form, they go, they, they equate it to Del Close or they think he's like the father of improv. And it's like, well, before him was Keith Johnstone and before Johnstone was was Spolin. And, and so like, I think like he might've advanced the cause of long form improv as an art form which he was kind of up against Second City, who were, who, whose philosophy was, no, it's, it's a tool to create sketch. So in one way, he, you know, Del Close advanced it to be more of a standalone art, art form or a legitimate out, art form as far as like long form goes. Um, Spolin and, and Neva Boyd were two very instrumental. Everything comes from them. So whenever you're talking about long form or anything like that, those all derive from short form, like in those games and the games were not used for performance. They were used to help children assimilate into America and overcome language barriers and, and things like that. So it's more of a life skill than a theatrical uh, experience, although both it's, it's powerful in both senses, but really it's a thing that helps people become better human beings, become more empathetic, um, listen better, stay in the moment better, become a part of something bigger than yourself. Like it's, it's a lot of philosophies share that same, all those same ideas. And it's interesting. I do a lot of um, corporate facilitation now and they're starting to adopt these improv phrases and it's like, bring your whole self to work. It's like, oh, well, that's acceptance. Like that's what we do in improv is we're already ahead of the curve with that as far as we want you to bring you to the party. It's not that you're all playing the same instrument in the band. You're playing different instruments. You're just trying to play the same song. So, and they say like, you know, um, be present. And it's like, well, that's an improv philosophy, right? Be here now. Like that's another term. It's like, yeah, moment to moment. So uh, all of the things that are starting to um, become really effective tools in just human communication, a lot of them are just things we learn in improv. So we have a couple of things. First of all, Monica, who runs this, uh, she's uh, in, uh, I can't remember where she's from. She's in Eastern European country, very powerful. She has this Facebook page called The Art of Yes, which is really good. But she identifies that Greeks improvised, Turkey also had storytellers who improvised before comedial art day. So that makes me want to look that up. But we have a question from John Gilkey, who's from, from Birmingham, awesome guy. He mm -hmm. asked, did Neva Boyd write anything about improv or do we have her contributions only from others? Like, do we only hear about her through Voyager? <laughs> Some of the game, some of the the books she's written are play and game theory and group work, uh, social group work, handbook of recreational games. Like she's written a whole bunch handbook of games. She's written a whole bunch of games, and if you go to Wikipedia, she's written a, a, a whole bunch of books as well. And so, if you want to really start diving deep into like the history of improv or text books, you can use. Um, I definitely would say check out some of the ones she's written. Awesome. Uh, Monica, just correct me. Thank you, Monica. I'm sorry. It's, she's Monica's from Poland. That's where Monica's from. Um, and then we had a question that someone asked in the previous um, that it's kind of a rhetorical question, but I, you might have some thoughts on it. Paul Quinn asked, if improv came from Viola Spolin and it came from these very powerful women, then how come in the current time the women aren't such huge, huge powerhouses or how come there was struggle for women to find a voice in improv? Do, because, do you know yes, because men are aggressive and men want to win and men treat everything as a game. And so they want to play in this aggressive style. And it's also women sometimes are battling the misconception um, that women aren't funny. And so what happens is you get a bunch of people, especially at theaters who are in power, who don't look to diversify. And so they stick with, sometimes it's like a fear of expanding. So they just go, I'm gonna keep the people near me that I know and that look like me and that agree to what I'm saying. 
and we don't we aren't as proactive as we can be and we don't give as many opportunities um it took people like you know i remember um there were several women coming up when i when i was coming up that said yeah well, we're not going to do that we're not going to sit there and we're not going to wait like i remember starting a class and it would be more like half women half men and then by the final level there's one or two women in the group and so what you're doing is you're not looking to give opportunities to other people. You're not looking, you know, as institutions, we should be looking and, and noticing students who it's like, oh, that person, they seem to have a good eye for it. I want to talk to them about teaching. I know they're in level three, but I think they've got a good eye for it. We're not the teachers who also for a long time were just white men. I mean, it's a shame, but you talk to a lot of people who have gone through training centers in Chicago or LA or whatever. It's like, how many non-white men have you had as a teacher and very few of them you know they'll go through years of classes and will have had no other option than to have white men and a lot of times at the higher up in these theaters it's like oh it's the, the person on top is that person and i think it's starting to change now for sure but i think it's it's a matter of um being aware of that and and being proactive in in being inclusive it's not something you could just sit back at. you have to be very active in the search for it so you have to continue to be active and also start talking to you know what we do is we don't talk to people when they leave improv yeah, they yeah. Leave. so it's like we have to start being aware of like why are they leaving well part of it is we want to we claim to make this a safe space and it's not always made a safe space and so what do people do is they'll just leave. They won't like tell you why they'll just go. And as a teacher, especially starting early, you have to, you have to set that expectation that this is a safe place. Then you have to be open to hearing people say things that you might not want to hear, such as like, I'm not feeling safe right now. And a teacher might go, oh, come on, you know, anything goes and like, don't be so PC. And that to me is the worst thing ever. It's like, if you, if you have to do that, scene about something inappropriate because you don't want to be censored it's like come on man like like get over yourself but this is a place where everyone is welcome and when you have more um people with different points of view it's going to make you stronger but for a long time it's like um it's and it this also goes to like a societal thing too where it's like the difference between men and women in a lot of societies and where where they are um but that's just from my point of view right that's just from what i observe it's also interesting to um, to talk to people who aren't like me, like the Jane Morris. And she's one of the people from early on that was one of those strong performers I was talking about. And she's also a great director and a great writer and a great actor. But when you don't give anybody opportunities and when you shut the door and you have theaters run by people who are making decisions who don't offer that, or you have theaters that say, no, women aren't funny. I was part of a theater that flat out said it. And I've been part of a theaters where the person in charge was a woman who thought that. And it's like, okay. So part of this is like opening a dialogue and a conversation and just being like, let's talk about it. And then saying, okay, now what are we going to do to address that issue? What are we going to do? And for a lot of like festivals, um, you know, they're also balancing. I know person X has a name in improv and I know I could sell out my workshops. Person Y might be a better teacher, but they don't have the opportunity or the name. So now it's like, okay, how do you balance that out? And that's great. that's something we're starting to see. Yeah, how, how do you balance that? Or that's a great question, I guess I'm just saying. That's that's an awesome observation and that's a wonderful question. I, I don't know. I, I think like I think part of it is you just start doing it and you you think of the long game and you go, great, this festival this year, maybe this doesn't sell out as much. But I know I've seen this, pe this teacher, this teacher is, is wonderful. They know what they're doing. They're going to add to the reputation of this festival right now. What they're doing, it might not be you know, shown with ticket sales, but it's, it's gonna be shown with the, the reputation we have moving forward. We're gonna be seen as one of those places that brought this teacher. And I look at it too like, oh man, imagine being the theater or the festival that gave that amazing teacher a start, that you were the one that let them come in. And then because of that, everyone fell in love with that teacher. That teacher knows what they're doing. That teacher brought so much to your, to your festivals. So you have to look at it that way too. It's like, what are these people bringing that you don't have? And a lot of times we think like it becomes this insulated boys club. So, so if anyone ever wants to know why I'm the way I am, this is, this is why, because Jay inspires me all the time like this. I, I completely agree with what you're saying. I completely agree. And, and as teachers, like from day one, level one, 
teachers have to start calling stuff out. They have to be like, nope, new choice. And they have to be like, stop. They have to give students the opportunity to go. I, my friend Andiel uh, has this thing where she, she has students go like this, meaning like, um, I don't want to, this is something that triggers me or, or is inappropriate. I don't want to be a part of it. And then she'll say like, you want to talk about it or just move on? And we should give students that opportunity. If you don't see it, give them an opportunity to say like, uh, this is triggering to me. And then don't judge it and don't be like, oh, you're, you're so triggered. It's like that, none of that matters. What matters is, do you feel safe enough? Are you going to come back next week? Do you feel like this is bringing something to your life? And a lot, we got to put ourselves as, as teachers in check too. Sometimes the teachers uh, are the ones that um, want to be like kings of the and queens of the room. And it's like, you got to put yourself in check there and, and be on the lookout. What are you doing to help everyone in the situation? Awesome, awesome, awesome. Okay, so let's go back to the timeline. And uh, 1940s, uh, the University of Chicago had an after-school drama society, but they didn't have a drama program. Uh, David Shepard, Bernie Stahls, Elaine May, Eugene Tronbrick, and Sheldon Patankin. So this is an example where the university didn't even have a drama program, but they had a drama club, and then those people moved on. And you probably know what they moved on to. Right? Well, and and you know, they, they formed uh, the Compass Players, which became, eventually became Second City. Exactly, exactly. Uh, they, they formed a, a group called the Playwright Club, but then that yeah. like a year later became the Compass Players. Um, and David Shepard and uh, Bernie Sauls were huge in Second City. They're like the founding members. You know what else David Shepard founded? You know what else? I.O. Improv Olympic. Oh, yeah, him, him. He him and Sherman together. Yeah, he and he wanted to do it. He wanted, yeah, yeah, it was him and he wanted to do it like improv, like a living room neighborhood. Everyone has their own improv team, like a board game. And so he made it, it wow. was improv. Yeah, it was improv Olympic, like an Olympic sport. They were short form games, but he was, yeah. So David Shepard is another person that had such a huge impact in improv. If you think about it, Second City and IO. That's it. Oh my gosh, huge. And so did he want to do like a format that's very like comedy sports where regions like competed against each other? Is that like neighborhoods? Mean? Neighborhood. Yeah. I met David Shepard. I have a David Shepard story. I met I read him in one of the improv books. And so I called him. I was in Chicago and I called him and he came to a comedy sports show. I was doing a short form show. And he came out. David Shepard came out and watched me do comedy sports and then afterwards I was like hey it's great meeting you and then he's like you want to get something to eat so we like walked around getting something to eat David Shepard and I stayed in contact with him but he wanted to he thought improv could be something you do in the living room like Yahtzee or charades so he wanted he wanted to make it accessible to people and that was his mission later on in life at least when I met him is he wanted to bring it into living rooms. so then you would have like neighborhood teams and it's like Oh, we're going to take on this neighborhood and we're going to do these short form games. But yeah, so that's, that's nuts. Yeah. That's nuts. You, you met him. And I love that idea too, of like, it becomes like you get to get on the weekend and just have these, have these short form games. Yeah. And I think you, a lot of times he was, he was ahead of his time in a lot of ways. And in that one too, it's like, oh yeah, where you're having this neighborhood game night and you're doing, you're, you're, you're doing short form improv. So one of the reasons I wanted to ask you, because I know that, because this is another thing I, I thought of you, is I remember back when you were my teacher, you told me this one time of a story how you were in a show and you had like no audience members, so you had to go to like the surrounding restaurants and stuff and say, hey, come see our show kind of thing. So when someone's before their time, it sounds very like rose-colored glasses. It sounds very like, oh, heroic, but What's the experience of being ahead of your time? It can be a lot of struggle. It can be very abrasive because you're working to get the status quo, right? Yeah, I mean, we humans romanticize the past a lot. And these stories get blown up. And so people start hearing these stories about like what it was like and this and that. I've done shows where you your bathroom was a bucket backstage. Like you didn't even have a chance to go to, to a bathroom because you were a, yeah, you were put in a corner somewhere and it's like, well, there's the bathroom. Um, the, the thing with the audience is like with Second City, when you would do your, your conservatory show, if you didn't have a certain amount of people, they would cancel the show. So you'd be like, you would go in and you would tell somebody like, I'll pay you to come to this show. And, and, and you know, it's not that far away from what thing people do now. You would, you would go on the street and flyer, like 
you would do anything you could. And you would also, for me, I'd look at it as a chance to do bits with my friends on the street. So kind of street theater. And we would do these bits and it just, that became as much fun as the shows themselves is doing it beforehand. Because you're always, even, you know, people right now, I'm amazed at how much different camps of improv don't like each other. And I'm like, back in the day, you imagine trying to explain what improv was to people who had never seen whose line is it anyway or have no reference so you're like it's like second it's like snl but you make it up like they don't so then people would think it was um a lot of times they think it's like stand-up comedy so they would come out expecting to see a microphone they didn't understand because there was no reference to improv so the fact now that people know anything about improv and they know what it is blows my mind. And the fact that there are people like Monica from Poland, who I met at a festival in Barcelona, I taught at a festival in Barcelona. I spent seven months running an improv theater in Denmark. I mean, come on, like, this is unbelievable. And so now the fact that we want to argue about what's the best secret club within the secret club, it's like, none of that matters. Nobody ever goes like, hey, you know what I needed from that show? A better format. Like, no cares. <laughs> they don't care. They're, they're like, if you just do work where you like each other on stage and you're you're entertaining and you're having fun and you're involving the audience and they're having fun that's it they're blown away that you're up there making it up they can't believe it that you're up there without a script it's a very impressive thing that we do when we improvise but a lot of times we want to have these divides and in smaller towns they want to have divides like you can't work at theater x and you're a theater y person and all that stuff and you know, when I, I remember having parties in Chicago when I was a young performer, it's like, oh, the front room was Improv Olympic, the hallway was Second City, the back room was comedy sports, and then after that were indie people. Like, it was that segregated at times, and then it's just like, it's become a lot better now. Like, there are a lot of people that teach in various places, but for me, I'm like, we're all in this together, and improv is the only art form, the only art form that somebody sees a bad improv show, like a show where they don't care, and they'll never see improv again. They'll yeah. never, they'll be like, I saw improv. And they'll see it once and that's it. So that's why I'm a big fan of like, dress a little nicer than your audience, like treat it a little more seriously, still have fun, but you're presenting a show to people. And um, they, these people might have never seen an improv show before. They might've had a bad day. Same thing like online now. There are people who are like, I don't wanna be online and, and it, I can't do the form and all that stuff. It's like, cool. If you don't wanna be online doing it, great. But I'm, I'm doing it because I'm excited about it. But I also have people who go, oh my goodness, thank you so much. It's the first laugh I've had was watching you. And so I'm like, okay, that's, that's why I wanna do this. I wanna do this so people laugh and feel better about themselves. So if that means I do a show where I don't feel as comfortable or I miss an edit or, oh, for God's sakes, I turned on the camera at the wrong time, it doesn't matter. None of it matters. Yes, yes. Yes to everything you just said. Yes to everything. I'm getting like an adrenaline rush just listening to you. Okay. <laughs> so we had a couple of things. Lisa Samuel said that she's literally been doing, because I think this is in, in reference to what you're saying about how um, David Shepard wanted people to do improv in their neighborhoods and yeah. stuff like that. Lisa Samuel says she's literally been doing improv in her own living room because of the quarantine. And she makes a little laugh emoji. And then Jason Hader, who's all such a wonderful person in the community. Yeah. He says his whole deal is short form improv for his community. He's always had his practice spaces offered by the members. We've always yeah. had our practice spaces offered by our members. Yeah. So that that is really touches on, especially in England, where it's much more like the indie scene right now. Just start a team. Just start doing improv. You don't need anyone's permission to do it. Just it's it, it, the art form belongs to nobody. And and with that too, like. Don't let a theater tell you if you're a good or bad improviser. It's just a style fit. So it's like theater X doesn't want you to be on their house team. That's okay. It's a style thing. You're going to enjoy it so much more when you stop trying to chase the approval of that theater. Take it from me. When you stop trying to chase the approval of that theater and you go back to why you're doing this, which is like, oh man, I'm, I'm just having fun. I'm playing with friends. I'm meeting new friends. I'm just, go back to that. And, and, you know, this levels the playing field because those those big theaters right now, some of them might not survive and some of them are trying to do the same online stuff you're trying to do. So I'm sure there are a lot of people who are improvisers who are way ahead of the game technology wise than a lot of these theaters are because these theaters are not, they were not prepared for this. 100%. And so now you have, a, you have a chance to be like, I don't know, create something with your friends. You know, I'm doing a 10 minute with scenes with a whole bunch of people. Cause it's like, oh, I miss performing with these people. I don't really like care if I get 
any notice of that. I'm just like, oh, I, I haven't seen Amanda Blake Davis in a while. What a fun time to do this. And we were doing a scene and I, I handed her a mind napkin. I'm like, here's the napkin. And she took a real one from her desk. And I was like, and only her. It's like unbelievable. So like the, all that stuff, now you, we can use moving forward to build upon and look at it like, what can we do now that we couldn't do before? That's the big difference. What are the possibilities, not what's being taken away from me? Yeah. Oh, I completely agree with you. I, I think that now is a time where it's really leveled the playing field a lot. Like you said, there's a lot of huge theaters that this is really challenged. And now me, one person at home is almost literally level with huge theaters that have been around for years. And I just want to do it to have fun. Like in, so what are you as an, as an improviser, what are you going to put out there? What are you going to do? Who are you going to connect with? Yeah. So Samuel says she loves Amanda and they grew up in a uh, musical theater together. <sighs> Yeah, she, Lisa, she is, you know, Amanda and I were roommates and we talked about it before our, our scene. We shared a closet, like my closet door opened up and if she had hers open, we could wave to each other. We shared a closet and it was just, but it was so much fun. And I've known her so long that to be able wow. to do this now, uh, it was just like such a joy. And she's one of those fearless performers. She's one of those fearless performers who is just like no i'm gonna play like here's the way i'm gonna do it and i and you know um fear be damned i'm doing it this way and if you don't want to join me cool i'm gonna do it anyway and she could do abdia is also great because she's got short form training she's got long form training music improv like she can do it all she's very versatile and it's fun jason hater jumps in on what you said about teachers and if schools are work for you to leave he says um, trying to please theaters, teachers can set up a hierarchy where some people's are winners and others feel like losers, which I fully agree with that. Well, but it's true. And especially if it's like the end of this training is not the training itself, but the end is a team. And when it's, it becomes a competition, which again, that's fine. And some people thrive in that and some people love that. But to me, it's like when I was back in the day, but like or I came up early nineties. So like 90, I got my first, class Christmas 91 and it started January 92 and it was like oh this isn't gonna go anywhere I'm lucky I'm, I'm very lazy and this is not I don't have any pressure so there was no like necessarily teams or anything like that it was just you were training just to train and you were like you kept taking classes and like I trained at Second City and I went through their their training program and then I I heard about that a guy named Del Close, my friends were like, let's go take a class with that guy. And so we, we went to another theater, but it wasn't like at the end of level, whatever you were on a team. It's like, no, you took two levels and then you had Del and you kept taking him until you were told not to take it. Or he said, I didn't, don't have anything to teach you or he kicked you out or whatever. So you just kept taking classes for the training and the, the, the love of it. Now it becomes a stepping stone. And a lot of these theaters also have access to like TV shows and in America, that's a big incentive for people is like, okay, this is going to help me get famous. This is, a, this is a shortcut for me to get on a TV show. So I got to get through this very fast and it becomes this competition thing. And then if you have the gatekeepers and the people who are making the decisions who don't see that or who teach different than what they showcase on stage, it's like, if you like teaching fast and funny, don't shy, teach fast and funny, but don't say you like teaching a slower a slower style and then people learn the slower style and then you get and you're like no everybody on stage is doing a fast style it's like embrace who you are and yep I, we teach fast silly fun we want people to be very clever awesome then let people there enjoy that but don't teach you know don't tell people we're teaching a slow don't try to be funny improv style and then when you look on stage it's like oh my god the people who get cast or all these people are trying to be funny all the time like like just say you're trying to teach people to be funnier like that's fine but like, don't, and then don't let that theater determine how good you are. If you get rejected by that theater, it doesn't mean you're a failure. It doesn't mean yeah. you're a reject. It just means like, it's a style thing. And that's it. Like your style doesn't fit with that theater. It doesn't mean you're bad. It doesn't mean you're good. It just means it doesn't fit with that theater. So there might be another theater or like do something with your friend, you know, go rent a bar. When all this comes back, go talk to a bar and say, Hey, you got Monday night seem dead. Can we have that stage? And we'll split the drinks. And if you're bringing in 20 people on a dead night, oh man, they will give you cash. And to me, I'm like, that's so much better than me doing a free show for, for someone else and bringing mm -hmm. them the money. So 
Um, on your on your point of, I'm going to go back to the timeline because I think this really relates to the point you're talking about how theaters have styles and being rejected by a theater doesn't mean you're you're not successful. Yeah. So going to 1967, I, I did I don't know who JJ Barry is, but he was a stand up that worked with Second City. He began working with another stand up comic in what they called free form comedy. So they were trying to do like a kind of an improvised stand up set, kind of where they would just come together. What are we? What topics are we going to talk about? But they wouldn't like have memorized material. And so this other comic he was working with was someone by the name of Richard Pryor. Pryor was never recruited by Second City because um, it, the, the, the story is so he could focus on his solo career, but it's possibly that Second City found him less trainable. So then fast forward to um, 1971, which is only four years later, Bernie Salins dis discovers John Belushi, who broke all the rules of what Second City was training and also proved to be less trainable, but someone willing to, they were willing to invest in. Um, so that's an example. Richard Pryor is prolific in his career and obviously didn't fit into the narrative they have. Did you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, there's a ton of, think? I think there's a ton of racism in, in Broadway, yeah. for sure. And, you know, for years it was like, you know, if you look at a, a theater like Second City where, I mean, the first two times they had two African-American men in the cast was, I think, Edgar Blackman and, and uh, Sam Richardson, which wasn't that long ago. And so it took a long time for, for you know, theaters to catch up to that. So I think it's, uh, it's definitely, and you look at like SNL too, and you look at Chris Rock, look, look at all Damon Wayans and Chris Rock, all these funny people that were on SNL that were not utilized or were given small roles. And again, it goes to like the people who are in power and making the decisions. CBS had a diversity showcase run by, by two white people for years and years and years. And it's like, you know, and it's a matter of like, can we open up this diversity thing? And you look at it, and so it's a stigma of the times as well. And you would think, you know, in a in theater, which seems to be more liberal in general, I think yes, it's, yes. it's still facing that. And I've had friends at Second City who go, you know, I parked my car and I walked on the block and people are looking out the window. And it's like, that's just a shame right there. And, and for me, selfishly for the theaters, you should be using people with different um, points of view and representing different people. Because if you go to an improv show and you see only people like me on stage, which happens probably 80% of the time, and you don't look like me on stage, I'm not representing you in the audience. So then it, you think, oh, that's not for me. That's not the thing for me. And so if we want to truly start evolving with this, it's like we have to give people opportunities so that we're showcasing um, a wider audience who can come in and go, that speaks to my point of view. And you have groups like 3 Pete, who's a group out of Chicago, who it's like, oh, they're, they're unbelievable. And they came in and they're like, this is our this is our truth. This is what we think is good. This is what we think is funny. And they, they get an opportunity and all of a sudden it's like, bam, they're just exploding, right? But like, if they don't have the opportunity, all those people get frustrated. Anybody who doesn't have an opportunity will get frustrated and turn to something else. And like, when you're looking at something like a solo career, it's like, yeah, because he can control that. He can go out there and do his work. He can go and attend stand-up mics. Um, I, I don't know what it's like in those situations. I only have my experience, but I don't know what it's like to be anything but me. Right. But I also know I can have these discussions and I can be open to evolving and open to my thought process and go, okay, what's going to benefit this thing as a whole rather than what's going to benefit me? Because it's, it's fun for a while when you're like, oh yeah, I'm the dude, I'm the guy. But like, it, it's not like it's once your ego is satisfied and you can take a step back and you could drop that ego, you can see, oh, look at all the opportunities that we're missing here as a, as, and we try, you know, we teach it in, in class and we teach it in corporate learning sessions, but we don't always show it. Yeah. We teach you. And as you go up the, the, the ladder of improv theaters, it seems that that whole yes and thing, that excitement, that philosophy, sometimes in bigger theaters, when you go up, it's lost as you get to the top. Yes. yes. Wow. OK, so we have a question from Cal Fun, who's in Hong Kong. Um, I like to encourage people that are online watching this, that if they ask a question, I get to ask you. This is a great question. So this question is, in Hong Kong, when I tell people I'm an improviser, they think he's a stand up comedian. Are there ways to help his community distinguish the two? That's his first question. Mm. Secondly, his audience wants them to do more short form and less long form. How can he balance what improvisers, what improvisers want to challenge and what the audience hopes to see in a show? 
So how do you help his community? Kind of how do you help uh, almost train your audience kind of thing? Like how do you tell them the difference between improv and stand up? And the second question is, how can you balance what improv improvisers want to do versus what the audience wants to see? His name is Coven, oh, Coven Fun. It's a great question. Well, Coven, I think um, you're not alone. Even in America, even in Chicago, the mecca of improv, people still don't understand what improv is. So you just keep doing it. I, I like to say, you know, maybe saying something like, oh, we're creating comedy on the spot or we're creating content in the moment. Because even when you do say improv, yeah, people a lot of times just think stand up. Even, even people who have seen it. I remember doing shows and my dad would come out to see my shows and I would be like, what do you think of the show? And he goes, ah, I've seen it. And it's like, no, it's improv, dad. Uh, it's all different, but I think it's, it's just a battle right now. I think it's a lot better now. People have a reference, but you might say, you know, for in America, whose line changed the game for a lot of people, because you could say, oh, have you seen whose line is it anyway? Um, so that, that's one way, but I think you'll, you'll always have that challenge um, in the near future. I think the more you do it, the better it is. Another thing is tell them, hey, come see my show. Like, that's a great invitation to be like, oh, I do a show on Thursday nights. Come out and see it. Like, you'll see what it is. We take something you say and we, we write on the spot. Uh, there's a group of people who use it to create scenes and, and um, humor. It's not like stand up where there's one person. There's a group of people. We're doing um, comedy by committee is, is oh, the way you could good. say it. Yeah, comedy by oh, committee. Um, and then the other one is, uh, oh, what can we balance? Well, here's my, this is just my philosophy, my point of view. I'm there to serve the audience in a way. And if the audience is there, I can still do short form and do good scene work. I can still use that. I can play my long forms a little bit faster. The audience wants to be entertained. If you come out there and you're like, okay, here's what we're doing. Um, we're gonna take a suggestion and then it's something that's complicated they're not going to understand your cool moves because they're not in it. They don't, they don't have the reference of classes that we do. And when you, you become an improviser, you want to make it like humans. You want to make it very complicated. It can't be real simple. So we want to do like, what's the unique style and format. And although that's fun, it's very challenging. We have to look at it from the audience's perspective a lot more than we do. That's why I'm like, show up like you care. Like it's a simple thing. The first thing they're going to see is you walking on stage. So walk like you own the place. Um, they're going to watch how you dress. And then when you leave, take a good bow. Those two things are so simple, but it's what the audience remembers, the first and last thing. So when you go up there, part of it is um, who are you doing the show for? Some There are some theaters that are like, oh, screw the audience, uh, F the audience this. They don't need to be here. It's like, great. Then just do it in your living room. I have no problem with that. I have no problem being like, cool. Let's like, I've done it a ton. I, I sit and hang out. A, I remember my buddy, Bill Baylor and I, we would sit and hang out a, a uh, the train station just doing bits and in character yeah oh yeah or we would dress up and be like let's go out to a um let's go to a bar and we we once dressed up and went to the bar as a uh, morning radio dj team <laughs> i'm like that's fine but like if i'm if i'm also promising the audience come see improv comedy and then i want to do art or i want to do something confusing i'm like i've broken my promise to the audience and so i've played you know i played zip zap zap uh, it's almost 30 years I've, I've been doing professional improv. I've played it probably two times a week and I can't play it enough. I'm like, so for me, those games and stuff, I find it challenging to be like, how can I make this still a good scene? And so I think people that discount short form either are not comfortable doing it or have heard someone else diss it. So they're going to diss it. But for me, I'm like, find the balance of it. Like the audience, the more involved you, you have them, the more invested and engaged they are in the show, generally, generally. Yeah. Now there are exceptions to all these rules, but really it's up to you. And it's, it's also like, what's, what's the, why are you doing the show? Are you doing it to make money? Which there's no, pro there's no problem with that. Then great. What's more digestible to an audience. Now, when you play short form, it doesn't mean you have to play the same, don't play the same games every time, like vary up your games. There's so many short form games and I see, seven of the same games mostly played and it's like no no no. there's a ton more you can do um that you 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 have to expand your your um resources so you go what are some other games we can do but for me i'm like that's that's the question is what does what's the focus of your show and then what does your group want to do yeah yeah I, that's, I think that's wonderful advice like 
one thing I say is like, when you get with the team, the first thing you should do is sit down and go, what does good improv look like to us? Like, what does the success look like to us? And exactly what you're saying is like, what is the vision of your team or company? What is your goal? Yeah. And kind of let that be your, your compass. Your, and, your... and Chris May had a good point. Uh, Chris May, first off, great improviser, amazing tattoo artist. So if you're ever in DeKalb, Illinois, or near the DeKalb area, just outside of Chicago, go see um, Proton is his um, a tattoo company, Proton. He said, it doesn't help that you see a lot of stand-up that are from the improv. Exactly. There's a, a comedy theater in the States called The Improv, and it does all stand-up. Yes. yes. So what you could do is just, you know, Colvin, what you do is you just start and, and just just realize you're going to be explaining what improv is a lot. That's just what it is. You can't get mad at people or, or frustrated or like, why don't they know? They just don't. Even in Chicago. Even in Chicago, there are a lot of people who are like, oh, Second City, you do, okay, stand-up. It just is what it is right now. I think Middle Ditch and uh, Schwartz have a show on Netflix coming out, which is long form improv. So that that might help it a little bit. I think at the top of the show coming out and saying, hey, we're going to create this right now in front of your eyes. Nothing you say here, nothing you see here has been scripted. This is all improvised comedy. Like you can say it in a way because um, sometimes even people come out and see improv shows and about two thirds of the way through, they realize it's made up. So your intro to these shows as well can help with that situation. That's a great point. Oh my God, that's a great point. Um, I did notice that you overlooked C Morgan Christensen's comment. Oh yes. Saying... <laughs> Morgan says, I don't have a question, but I just want to say David is looking cute AF. And I cannot agree more, Morgan. From one cute AF guy to another, Morgan is yeah. cute AF. Yeah, um, cute acknowledges is cute. <laughs> Morgan, and again, and one of those, uh, another great performer too. Like we're very blessed in, in Los Angeles. He, he's out of Westside Comedy Theater. And he's another guy that just is like a joy to watch on stage. And you oh, watch gosh. that guy and you're like, man, he makes it look easy. But he's just out there having fun. Talk about like TJ, TJ Jagodowski says effort is ugly. Morgan is like someone that makes it look effortless. Like, yes. oh, wow, this is a beautiful moment that I'm in right now. Love Morgan. Awesome. Yeah. And I bet Morgan also after shows is the hardest on himself at times too, because that's what we do. And it's like, everyone goes, everyone says to other people, wow, you look at, you make it look effortless up there. And a lot of times it's like, oh, it's not at all. Like sometimes you just struggle and sometimes you're in the zone for sure, but it's not the fun. Why, why I'm still doing improv is I can't master it. It's one thing in my life where I'm like, I've never done a good, uh, like a great, perfect scene. So I'm, I'm still chasing that one. Wonderful. So this will be the last question we take because we're almost coming upon the end of our hour. But Stephen St. Laurent, I don't know if you see his question. He's seen lots of online improv for the most part. It seems that it misses the mark. Do you think there's a way to change the form in a way that uses the strengths of the interactivity of live streams? And we talked about that a little bit already, but you might want to. Did well, you see Jillian's comment? Yeah, Jillian, nice painting. Yes, Jillian, as a matter of fact, I did paint that right beside me. So if you'd like a painting commission, uh, I'm in a Jackson Pollock phase right now where I'm throwing paint. Um, well, I would ask Steven, I'm like, what's your definition of missing the mark? Like, what does that mean to you? Like when, when you say it misses the mark, what is, what is that? Um, so Steven, if you're still watching, if you want to type in what, what you mean by that, because it could mean several things. Um, I think we talked a little bit about it, which is, um, you know, you're trying to, it's not going to work as well if you're trying to force something that works very well live in front of an audience right there to feed off the energy. If you're trying to force that into this new format, which is, that's just not what it is right now. Some games and exercises for sure translate to this, but it's like, start thinking about ways to utilize the technology rather than fight against it and struggle against it and be upset with it. It's like, this is what we're, we have right now. So if you want to um pause your improv and not do it that's your choice that's fine absolutely like if this doesn't suit you wonderful uh if you want to continue to improvise well what are some things that work and then build on that um like for me i look at it and i go this is a good chance to do like two person scenes this is a good chance to do like what can we do with costumes and technology when when i started uh, and, and even today comedy sports was a short form group that i grew up <laughs> being a part of as far as my performance I, it made me a better performer and we had costumes and we were made fun of we had like wigs and stuff like that but it was super fun when you got a suggestion and it made you more into character because you were wearing this thing so there are different things you could do I think it's just a trial and error thing so 
um, maybe missing the mark is because it's not uh, it's not a live thing. It's also very hard to do. Like I tried a 10 person Armando style long form and you have 10 people. So you're navigating like, Oh, who's on now. I'm going to stop my video. I'm going to start my video. Uh, how do we edit? Wait, I didn't hear you. The, the, the technology's lagging. I can't, it, it, there's an echo, like you're going to battle all that stuff. So it's going to be a little clunky at first, but I think the more you, you, you do it, the easier it gets and the more comfortable you get with it. But as far as like missing the mark. Um, uh, oh, it, Steven, thank you. Uh, seems as though the characters always seem so forced or isolated. Um, yeah, it might, it might be for sure. And that's gonna happen. Uh, and it's, it's isolated because of like more than anything else, it's what's going on in the world. So like the first few scenes I did, it was like, oh, this is terrible. I'm trapped, it's the end of the world. Like just because of what's happening outside. And so there are those moments and if you can, change your background and you put a different virtual background that might help with the illusion of not just being in your living room. So the other thing I think that is really important to point out is a lot of the improv that we've been practicing is stage acting, which like in stage acting, this works a lot, but, but because the camera is so close to the face, like you yeah. can read the disingenuous of like, Oh, that's a thing. And you know, it's not angry. So you have yeah. to kind of change your style of acting to be way more like subtle and more authentic than we're used to. Yeah, you're right. It's almost like improvising for the camera, which is different than improvising on a stage. Yeah, and it's gonna yeah. it's gonna reveal the dis, you know the not dishonesty, but the it's gonna reveal more because it's in this smaller format, so that everything you do is gonna be um, uh, so much more pronounced. But you could do some cool yeah, things of like, what if you go into the camera, and what if you look this way, and you go, hey, 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 like you start changing the perspective, which you couldn't do on a stage as easily. Right. 100% or you can do stuff like you can have stuff come in from the sides that you couldn't do on yeah. stage as easily. Um, unfortunately, I got, we had a question from John Gilkey. Unfortunately? I find it. I, well, no, we, I can't find it. <laughs> unfortunately, Gilkey. Uh, <laughs> oh, well, um, you, um, what do you think are the best things improv theaters give an improv scene? Should scenes without dedicated theaters make it our priority? Yes. Um, well, in one way, improv theaters have been really good at like monetizing the art form for sure. And monetizing, like it, it's very hard to just teach improv theaters now are saying, here's our style. So they made it really good. A lot of it at like narrowing in a style for a lot of times. Um, I think a lot of the smaller theaters, but a lot of theaters in general, the smaller ones specifically uh, help build a community of a place that people can go and meet other people. That community might get skewered or uh, once you go up and then you bring in the aspect of like competition um, as far as like getting on a team. So that might be somewhat of a drawback, but I think for a lot of people, it's like a, a clubhouse that they go into. I think I think also it's, it is a place that you can go and like uh, you can sit and, and before this whole thing, um, this, this whole COVID-19 happened, you had a place to go and, and take a class and like, you had a location where you can go to and use that, which you don't have that as much anymore. But like, if you wanna learn um, how to do this type of improv, you, you could go to this kind of theater. And now that we're online, you can reach out to those theaters or those teachers and be able to take those classes and learn those skills, which you might not have been able to do before. Awesome, so that's the last question we're gonna take because we only have three minutes left and there's still one thing I, I wanna get your thoughts on. Um, first of all, I want to answer because Jillian Bellinger asked me um, the sweet notes behind me. Uh, I was telling Jay, this is a, a drawing that I drew. That's actually a practical Alfonso Chabana. It's a TARDIS. And it's, and it's all drawn on pages of how to be famous from a book that's like how to make it big in, in movies and stuff. So the last thing I want to ask you, Jay, is... Um, is in 1996, because I think one of the things I want to ask you, some you probably know most of these people. In 1996, a group of women created an all-female team called Jane. Jane yeah. was created by Katie Roberts and Stephanie Weir, which was revolutionary in women playing men and playing roles other than in relationship to men. Their founding members were Stephanie Weir, Tammy Sager, Abershur, Abby Sch Schockner, Monica Payne, Bina Martin, Molly Cavana, and Sue Maxson. Tammy Sager, yes, and Abby Shackner, uh huh, yep, yeah. those. So well, just 
it was supposedly the first all female team, I guess, and it was very revolutionary. Did you ever get a chance to see them or work with any of those? Uh, you might ask Jane Moore. She might have been on an all female team before then, but I think that was one of the first long form, uh, really? for sure. Stephanie Weir and I were in conservatory together at Second City. She's married to Bob Dassey, who was in my first improv class and like my first kind of improv friend. Um, I know Abby Shackner. Um, I know most of them. Bina Martin, I know she teaches at Second City. Um, she's also a facilitator. I, and I used, uh, I worked with Bina. I, I um, had her in a pilot I, I shot as part of a competition for um, uh, Comedy Central a few years ago. I had her, I didn't really know her, but I'm like, I think you'd be good at this. And so she ended up playing my wife in it and she was outstanding. Um, yeah, and Stephanie Weir is one of those people that like, you watch her and you're just like, <sighs> she was just born with it. And she was one of those, and that group was very pivotal in as far as like, the uh, overcoming the aggressive play of a lot of dudes and all of those women in that group are strong so strong on their own but then you bring them together and they just brought again it was just imagine seeing improv and you see groups with one woman and all guys and you're you're watching that and you're a woman and you're a young girl coming up or you know you're you're a teenager and now you see a group who reflect you and who you are and you're like Wow, I can do that. And you see women play like believable men. You see it, you see it in a different way. And like they also had really, every one of them have great acting chops too. So I remember I've seen them perform and I've worked with a, a few of them for sure. And like, they're just such a joy and such strong um, performers that, yeah, they were very important. Um, and from that, a lot of other all-female groups kind of so we could do that too. Like there's a group Sirens, which is made up of Amanda Blake Davis is in that group. And it's Abby McInerney who has this Showtime special now called Work in Progress, which is unfucking believable She's so great and so funny and so nice. And Aaron McAvoy and Joanna Beasy and like, like um, Molly Erdman, who does a killer um, Elizabeth Warren impression online. And then, uh, so there are all these groups that sprung out out of that because they said, oh, we can do it too. Like, um, and they might've, formed themselves anyway but like Jane was one of the first groups that kind of like especially in long form kind of opened the door to something that hadn't been seen before and they were you know tremendous and then like a group like the Katie Dids who were a group of women who all had names that were Kate or Catherine or Katie they're like let's we should do a show together and they were going to do one improv show and then they ended up getting working together so much and shot this this um, series of, of webisodes called Teachers where they all play teachers. And then they, they got a TV show and they were on a cable network. It's called Teachers. It's a great, it's a very funny show, but like that all sprang out of that. So like, if you can open up improv to people that can represent everyone, then we're gonna see the reward of that. It's gonna grow exponentially. If we keep it sheltered and this hidden club that only a few people have keys to, well, then pretty soon it's going to die, you know? Yes, yes. It's going to die. And I took, I, think, a, I took a class with with Del Close for a while. And like, he was a guy that was like the gatekeeper and like he would kick people out of class. I was in class where he kicked people out. And I was like, okay, I guess in one way that's fine. But in another way, it's like, who who is that person to say? Just like when people ask me my opinion on students, like at theaters, like, should they be on a team or whatever? I'm like, I don't know. What's your, for me, that's not the goal. The goal is not like this person is better than this person to be on a team. For me, it's like, well, what's, you know, again, what's your criteria? Do you want somebody who's grown this whole time? Do you want somebody who is open to notes? Do you want, you know, which my friend Jillian Bellinger is always open to notes. That's why she says OTM, it's open to notes. Um, but I, I feel like I'm not a gatekeeper in any way. I can't tell you who's good or bad. Like I know it's so subjective. I don't know who's good or bad. I don't even know what, like if you're speaking of a style, I don't know what the style is. I can't tell you. It's not my job. My job, I, I stopped. I used to like go to college improv tournaments uh, and judge them on criteria. And I was like, I can't do it anymore. I don't know like risk. What is risk to this team? I don't know what risk is. I cannot tell you. I, and I don't want to be the person. It goes against what I think of improv, which is no judgment, which is yes. And so for me to judge something is counter. I don't, I don't like cage matches. I don't like tournaments. I don't like any of that stuff because I'm like, we can't be competing against each other. I was in comedy sports. The competition was all part of the show. So you knew where you were in the show and some shows you're like, Oh, I'm on the team that's going to lose. 
so let's lose like you but that was part of the show it wasn't like uh we that means we're losers it's like no it's just it's part of the the format that the show was in and so we all knew that but it wasn't a thing of like this competition of you're going to be cut from a team like Jay, you always inspire me. Thank you so much. Like everything you're saying, I'm like if anyone wants to know why I talk and 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 all the stuff I say, but this this is why Jay is why. Thank you oh. so much for taking the time to doing this. And thank you, David. And it's thanks to people for me, like Jeff Michalski and Jane Morris and and Martin Demott and David Rosowski and Colbert and Carell and all these people I had as teachers. And like, I'm just saying the stuff that they told me. Like none of the things I say is like really an original thought. It's more like, oh, that struck with me. And like for all those people watching, when P improv teachers talk to you and they, they, they share thoughts, these are all tools, not rules. There's no one way to do it. So they're tools, not rules, y'all. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it is 11. It's almost 10 o'clock where I'm at. So I got to get going. Got to feed the cats. Jay, love you. Thank you so much. Love you so much, David. You're such an inspiration to me and so many other people. And you have been doing this online improv for so long. And Improv Boost is such a great thing for the community. Uh, and it's always a pleasure seeing you. Thank you. Have a good rest of your day, Jay. I'll talk to you soon. I'll see you probably tomorrow, uh, Saturday. Oh, cool. Yeah, I'll see you Saturday. We're doing 10 minutes. Yes. Oh, I have a question. I know this is like in class time, but I have a question about that. It's at 2.30 your time, right? Which is 10.30 my time, I believe. Yeah, I think so. Cool. Awesome. All right, buddy. Adios, Jake. See ya.